Hello, I'm David Coffey, and I'd like to turn to God's word and read to you from Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Now, what we have come to here in the Bible in Matthew chapter 5 is the Sermon on the Mount. Let me remind you that there are um, two parts to the Sermon on the Mount. In verses 1 to 12 of Matthew 5, we have the Beatitudes, if you like, the, the happy life. The secret of joy is living under God's rule. And the theme of verses 1 to 12 of Matthew 5 is be different. Uh, verses 1 to 12 are about Christian character, Christian values, Christian lifestyle, a life lived in humble dependence upon God. It's about truth-telling, peacemaking, forgiving, and so on. Verses 13 to 16 are about making the difference. Be different, making the difference. What Jesus wants is that the Christian character that he speaks of in the earlier part of the chapter, these are brought to be influential in a needy world. You are the salt. You are the light. God intends us to be salt and light. In fact, the true translation is this. Jesus is saying, you and you alone are the salt of the earth. You and you alone are the light of the world. So for this to happen, Christian values and Christian lifestyle have to be in touch with the world. Salt has to be rubbed into the wounds of the community. Light has to shine in the dark places of the world. Sometimes I think when danger uh, in the community, crime, violence, lawlessness, the spiritual darkness that we sometimes experience. Sometimes these are so much for us to bear, we walk away from them. And when we read these beatitudes, these beautiful beatitudes, they seem so feeble, so small and helpless. I mean, I ask you, the poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek, the hungry for righteousness, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, the persecuted, the reviled. What difference can these beatitudes make? Well, don't be deceived by the enemy. God intends Christian lifestyle to make a difference. His word to us is, be different and you will make a difference. You and you alone are the salt of the earth. You and you alone are the light of the world. I often say to myself, who's saying these words to us? Jesus Christ, feel the weight when Jesus says, be different and you will make a difference. If God intends his followers to make a difference by being salt and light of the gospel, he will find ways to make this happen. And the second thing is, of course, the world needs the salt and light of the gospel. Uh, you're aware, aren't you, that in the Bible there are two ways in which the Bible uses the words earth and world. Uh, there is the world as God intended it, as described in the book of Genesis. God created a, a beautiful world and a fertile earth, and God looked out on this world of beauty and said, that's good. But there's another way that the Bible describes earth and world. It can mean the world without reference to God. When the world is left to its own devices, the Bible is very plain speaking. It has a bias to become morally rotten, and it is prone to to moral decay. Where there is no salt and light of the gospel, people suffer. There is a growth of poverty, injustice, greed, hatred, and spiritual ignorance. What one great Christian leader said, in the nation without the salt and light of the gospel, you have might without morality, and you have power without compassion. The function of the salt of the gospel is to halt moral decay. It serves as a moral disinfectant. It preserves and protects, it cures. And the function of the light of the gospel is to warn and attract. It simultaneously shines in the dark and also reveals a safe path to travel. 
I was blessed with a, an Irish grandmother who lived until she was 99 years and six months. Uh, I loved staying with her because when I stayed with her, she would uh, serve the main meal. But on the sideboard, there would be the seconds, what might be called the pudding or the dessert. And if she saw, with my main meal in front of me, if she saw me looking longingly at my pudding... She would say to me, do you want your pudding first? A question never asked of me at home. Of course I wanted my pudding first. My grandma reasoned that it was all going down the same way, that whether the roast beef or the apple pie landed in the stomach first, it didn't matter. I loved her. Now, my grandmother had no telephone. She had no refrigerator, and she had no car. I can remember standing in her kitchen watching her take a huge joint of meat and rub salt into that meat. She was preserving. She was protecting. She was curing. I didn't realize at that young age that I was being given a visual aid of the gospel, the salt and light of the gospel. When Christian values and a Christian lifestyle are rubbed into the life of a community, it preserves and it protects that community. If God intends us to be the salt and light of the gospel, friends, why is it that the church doesn't believe in the salt and light ministry? Somebody did a a survey a few uh, years ago as to why the church fails to be the salt and light of the gospel. I won't give you all the answers, but I will give you the top three. These were the top three reasons why the church doesn't get involved. Number one, The church was preoccupied with theological disputes and denominational differences. Number two, the church believed Jesus is coming back very soon and the world will never change. Number three, the call, the church is called to be separate, come out from the world, leave the world to the wicked and get on with being a pure church. I could go on depressingly and give you the other main reasons why churches don't get involved in salt and light ministries. I don't know whether you've spotted verse 13 about the salt losing its saltiness. I think the salt losing its saltiness are attitudes like this. Whatever else Jesus meant, I think he was more likely using this as a metaphor. Salt meant wise, unsalted meant foolish. A foolish believer has no influence in the world. We're intended to be the salt seller of the world. Just as the salt cellar on my dining table is meant to be shaken out of the salt cellar onto the food, when our gospel salt remains in the salt cellar, that's a foolishness. A German Christian once said, beware of a religion which is only concerned with not doing anything wrong. We look at the world and say, what a dreadful mess. I believe God looks at his world and says, where is the salt and light of the gospel? And of course, the salt and light of the gospel can transform communities. It's been my privilege over many years now to travel not only in my own country, but to many parts of the world. And everywhere I've traveled, it's been inspiring to see the transforming influence of salt and light ministries. I've seen it amongst the street children of Ecuador. I've seen it on the streets of Bangkok. I've seen it in my own town where I live, where we have street pastors It was deeply inspiring to be present at a commissioning service for street pastors where the mayor of the town and the chief of police were present and people who had been nervous about the ministry of street pastors now recognise this salt and light ministry has huge influence. There was one community, I heard their story, where the churches were in despair about the levels of violence that took place and everything came to a head in this community when in some gangland warfare, one of the young men was stabbed to death on the pulpit steps of one of the churches. The church leaders got together and decided they needed to go and meet with these gang leaders. They met with them and the gang leader said, I'll tell you the difference between us and you. When the children come out of the school gates at 3 p.m., the drug baron said, we're there and you're not. When the parents send their children to the shops at six o'clock, we're there and you're not. 
When the children go to the playground at 7 p.m., we're there and you're not. And in that moment, the church is brought to birth their 24-7 ministry. They vowed that wherever the people were, that's where they would be. When you have this kind of commitment, I suggest to you that salt and light can begin to do its transforming work. And here's the final thing I see in this passage. And that is that everyone is called to the salt and light ministry because all of us have the potential to be salt and light. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then the potential in you to be salt and light minister is right there. We don't all possess great wealth. Not all of us have vast talents. But if Jesus has shined the light of the gospel into our lives, then we can shine for him. One of the recurring questions I face as a pastor is, David, could, could the Lord use somebody like me? And the answer is always yes. I can't say specifically where you fit into God's mission. If you're concerned about the broken communities and the state of our society, you understand the principle of salt and light. Offer yourself to be a salt and light minister to him and he will show you. Stories told of the woman in her 60s who felt that uh, God had not passed her by. She came to her pastor and she said, the Lord has spoken to me through one of your sermons and he wants me to use my gifts in his service in a new way. So the pastor said to Mary, well, where do you feel gifted? She said, the Lord has given me a love for young people. The pastor was very diplomatic, but he felt flummoxed because he he actually felt that Mary, perhaps her best days at basketball and table tennis were over. And uh, he wondered how she could help. She said, well, I've got an idea. She said, you're always advertising that there should be people who would come down to help with the, the youth club. You say you've got a very challenging youth club on a Friday and there are insufficient helpers. She said, I think the Lord has given me a ministry I could do. The pastor said, what's that? She said, I'd like to stand on the door and welcome the young people into the youth club. Everyone had their doubts about this offer, and be honest, you're not impressed about the wisdom of the offer. But eventually the youth club leader said yes, and so Mary stood on this door on a Friday night in all weathers. She did it for a period of 20 years, and the first thing she did was she learned the names of all the young people entering that youth club. As they arrived, she would say, Jack, welcome. Patsy, it's great to see you. Liam, I missed you last week. She was on the door when they left the youth club and she had some microwave questions for the young people. What kind of week are you facing? How's life at home? What's it like at school at the moment? When she got home, she remembered the names of the young people. She recalled what they had shared and she prayed for those young people seven days a week. She did this ministry for 20 years. Young people came and they went and one day she wasn't on the door. And when the young people inquired where Mary was, they discovered she'd had a stroke and she'd become housebound. The youth club was very kind. They sent her flowers and, and then someone came up with a big idea to encourage Mary and a delegation was sent to explain the idea. They arrived at Mary's home. They came in. They sat down. They said, Mary, we would like to do your funeral service. Mary said, but I haven't died yet. They said, no, we want to give you a Thanksgiving service before you die. We want to say thank you for all you've done to us. Well, the Thanksgiving service day arrived and what they had done, you can imagine over 20 years, there were dozens and dozens of young people who had been shaken by the hand by Mary as they entered. They were now 35 years of age. They had their own children. They all returned to say thank you to a woman who had discovered she could be involved in God's salt and light ministry. Salt and light ministry. God intends it. The world needs it. It makes a difference. Everyone is included, especially you.